I'm Bernan Diaz Alonso, the director here of the school. Welcome to SIARC. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Winka Doubledam, um, who is a very old, yeah, we've been friends for a long, long time. I hate the expression old friends because it makes us sound like we are old. No, it's an old friendship with very young people. Um, uh, I, as I said, I, I know Winkham for many, many years. And I, actually, I realized that when, when you have to introduce people that you know well and you're close friends, actually it's way more tricky than to introduce people that you have a certain distance. So I was trying to figure it out, what, what would be the angle uh, in terms of tonight uh, conversation and uh, uh, the tonight introduction in relation to what Winka will show up, show us today. And a couple of things it come to mind. One is, uh, on top of it, the principal and founder of Architectonics, her firm in New York, Winka is the chair of the School of Architecture at UPenn, which happens to be probably the school that we have the most fluid friendship and relation and similar ethos and ideology within the East Coast. If the East Coast, West Coast is still is such an issue, which I don't think it is anymore, um, but for those who keep track, I will say this is, has been, and it is, a very important relation for us. Um, I think what, what she's doing there with the school, it shares a lot of ambitions and desires that we have. And talking about desire, um, in honor of, of where Wink is originally from, um, I was trying to think what is the context in which I think what makes her work very relevant for us to discuss. And I think it has to do with many variables, but if I have to isolate a couple, the one that seems to me the most interesting one is Winka belongs to a group of people that um, it came from academia into practice and remain involved in academia back and forth in the time when we were talking about the beginning of the digital revolution, and then now it's an established thing and, uh, to a point that it's not relevant to discuss in those terms anymore. But like many here in this room, but not so many of that group of people, she really decided to embrace all the pains and all little amount of pleasure that come from practice. And this is why I think this Dutch proverb, opportunities create desire, seems very much in tone, which what I think is at the heart of her practice. I think um, she embraced, and her office embraced the constraints, the problem, market, developers, clients, all the things that come with is running a professional practice of architecture, which for many of us, we know that this is not an easy, is at all task. So, but what I think it makes her work important and relevant is in that embracement and that in that attitude, opportunity creates desire. When everybody will see limitations and will see constraint, Winka sees opportunities to create desire, to challenge what is available, what it can be done. And this is something that sometimes in a school we forget to discuss, or we take it for granted, or we don't assume the difficulty that can between navigating the discipline and the profession, and how they go back and forth. Um, I was mentioned the other day in one of these AIA conversations about, uh, for those of us who speak Spanish, the word practice is a strange thing when you talk about practice, because practice means it's what you do during the week in training to play on Sunday. And I always think that architects who practice, actually they're not, well, there are some of us who just practice, and we keep practicing and we never get to play. We never get to jump into the field. Um, but I think there are other kind of architects, like Winga, who is not, they don't do practice, they just do stuff. It's getting involved in that. So I really like this idea of opportunity to create desire, or you can flip it and say how desire creates opportunity, and I think this becomes a back and forth. So out of the many things and many virtues that her work and her career as an academic can have, I think in this particular time, this, I will say, is what is, for me, more intriguing to, to hear um, tonight. And the other thing I, I, I want to mention is, uh, and this has to do with lecture series and conversations and so on, and this relation between Sire and Penn, is we, never, we should never forget that architecture is very tribal, and it's very family, groups of families. And I think it's important for us to remember that there are certain things that we have affinities versus another ones. And I think these debates are very healthy. And I will argue that lately, we tend to set up sometimes 
to kind of find common grounds instead to emphasize the differences and how that can become a productive one. In this particular case, that it will be a little bit more tricky because as I said, I think there is a lot of common ground to cover. Anyway, um, it's my pleasure to welcome Winka once again to SIARC. Thank you, Hanan. And then I came to New York and I got OCD. Does everyone know what OCD is? <laughs> Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. Went straight into that. Um, yeah, today I wanted to talk about new solids or solids. Um, I had a great interview with Florencia earlier and uh, we talked a lot about how uh, how you work, you know, how do you start a practice, where do you start, how do you create things, and I realized actually that she asked me many questions that I have never really uh, thought about, or, or she saw relationships that I maybe have actually never seen, and one thing I mentioned to her is that that conversation should have really happened here on stage, because I think we, we kind of were brainstorming about things that are really interesting for uh, when you are studying and how to figure out like where do you go and how do these things happen, you know, like where do you actually start. Um, I am going to run, because I was thinking about solids, you'll see glimpses of a little bit of things we've done earlier, but only glimpses that have to do with solids. Um, and I got interested in solids, maybe, <laughs> uh, because I, always have figured out that things that are close to ugly are more interesting than beautiful things for me. You know, I know this aesthetics and for me, so I have an other understanding of aesthetics. You'll figure that out soon, I get that thing. Um, but I think that the reason why I think that that maybe a schizophrenic moment between something that is really ugly and something that has character or that has maybe another level of beauty is interesting for us is because um, we feel that that is where interesting things happen. So there is a new interest in the body and the solid in massive forms, no longer minimal light and thin, but full bodied, soft, glowing, and sometimes transformative. These solids gives us comfort, ground us, and wrap us in a soft embrace. They are not anonymous, cold, and sleek, like modernism, uh, but they have character, identity, and make us smile. To give an example, I used to own a pacer, made me smile to go back to architecture. Um, interesting is uh, a lot of the times, I, one of the little books I read a lot when I was uh, starting as, a, as an architect was a, a book written by Edmund Husserl, um, The Origin uh, of Geometry, uh, written I think in 1937. And interesting about that book is that one quarter of the book is the actual text of Edmund Husserl and three quarters of the book is the introduction by Jacques Derrida. And Jacques Derrida writes that bottom um, little sentence where he discussed the mathematical objects um, and how, that, how he sees that relative to um, what Husserl saw and why he feels uh, it's relevant. Therefore, it is always already reduced to its phenomen phenomenal state, uh, sense and its being is from the outset to be an object for a pure consciousness. So the object for the object. Back to solids. So this is a project we, we started early on thinking about. Um, I was really interested initially in a two and a half dimension, a surface that had um, kind of texture, depth, something you could occupy, um, an interactive membrane rather than a separative, divisive um, wall. So the integral solid was a, a project where we um, looked at building a house um, for people in the middle of nature, probably the hardest thing you could ever do. You have no context, uh, no challenge, and you kind of start to think what is the essence of the house. And for us, the essence of the house was to think of um, making all the hyperactive functions of the house into um, a molded 
surface that essentially the object that contained all functional requirements, but not so much because they contained all the functional requirements, but because it gave us a chance to shrink wrap uh, a shape around that, not unlike the motorbike uh, mold uh, next to that, where um, that shape would then um, be the driver of the house, and the house itself is almost not designed. It's more the, the kind of uh, loft-like space that spins around it. Um, it also erased all hallways. I have a total um, uh, kind of negative kind of feeling about hallways, I guess. Um, and the, the, the armature, as we called it, uh, contained essentially cooking, bathing, uh, cooling, heating, sound systems, uh, and all those kind of things. And then what we thought was interesting about building something like that was that um, it created, and this is an installation we built with the MIT Media Lab, uh, sort of an interactive floor, but that the object itself wasn't as important as the fact that it created other environments. So in this holographic uh, installation that we had in a gallery, a Frederick Taylor Gallery in New York, we kind of studied how this object could transform into something that is more of an environment. Um, essentially, the interactive floor that um, the um, uh, Media Lab built, uh, there were sensors in the floor that basically could transform the object. So the object looked uh, very much like uh, the object you just saw before, but the moment you hit one of those tiles, it would transform into something like this, and it was twist me, push me, whatever were the commands. And then it had um, speakers that were robotic speakers that, um, have a uh, scrambled sound, so only when it hits a surface, the sound would come out of it and um, would then, oh sorry, I have to actually switch. There we go. And the sound would then come out of the object, out of the floor, or out of you. Essentially, this is the house, so uh, as you can see, the, the object also pulls the roof surfaces towards itself, creating the, the lightest space in the middle rather than the outset. And this, you could say, is where uh, that initial thinking started. Now, interesting is this is all, <laughs> you could say this is a very rational project, right? You first have the, this is literally washing machine pipes, uh, whatever. Um, in the middle is where the appliances are added, and then the shrink wrap, which is a really beautiful story that we actually made for the gallery, uh, is not how we designed it. We, we literally designed it more like, you could say, how you design a car. Um, a kind of a unibody uh, idea. Um, and it was also the first time that I realized how hard it is to explain those things to a contractor. Um, this is then where you are in the middle of the space. The bathroom uh, is really a, a nice point because it ends, this glass skylight comes down as a glass wall and that is also the shower. Um, Actually, my client at some point stood in that shower and said, do you sh think we need a shower curtain? So you live in the middle of nowhere. Why would you have a shower curtain? And he pointed across the lake on the mountain, and he saw a tiny little mountain biker. And I was like, well, that guy. And I said, OK, let's go on the lake. So we went on the rowboat on the lake and sat on the lake and looked at his shower, and you could definitely not see it. So there's no curtain. But I have showered there once when it was raining. It was a really weird experience, because water was kind of coming from everywhere. And then on the outside is also kind of uh, this very heavy body. So you're very aware of this thing in the whole house. It's not exactly a, a small object, but it contains all kinds of uh, moments where you can interact with it. Like here, you basically interact with the kitchen, the fireplaces for, li for the living and dining. And the doors turn more into reflective, um, almost like light reflective screens rather than doors itself. So they are not overly serious, but yet often are a feat of great engineering, new material ecologies, and groundbreaking production methods, at least for contractors. That is interesting also. You have to understand that what's groundbreaking for us is not groundbreaking in sight. In short, they stand for innovation, with intuition and skill where, while intuition and skill remain at the core of our design process. We supplant and supplement this knowledge with advanced digital form generating and prototyping tools merging into what we consider digital craft. 
a soft solid. Here we worked uh, on a project that is a, uh, was actually a really fun project. Um, a former intern of ours, um, I don't know what we did to him, but he became a fashion designer. A very famous fashion designer, Ziki Im, very good. And he had a fashion biennale in Holland and said, well, since we worked together so long, why, well, long is internship, uh, why don't uh, you do the uh, pavilion? And it seemed a really great thing to do. So question was, give me your favorite pattern. We will make from that pattern a pavilion. That seemed a really good way to go. Um, sadly, he gave us the most boring pattern. He has absolutely the most amazing fashion line that is very um, neutral between male and female. It's kind of an interesting, constantly flip-flopping uh, thing. And he gives us the perfect jacket. So that was a little disappointing. But we were not, we basically dismantled the jacket. We just, no, no, don't give us the jacket. Give us the pattern only. And then in Maya, we transformed that and started thinking about the unibody again and how we could make this uh, pavilion something that had to do with fabric, with lining, but also with the idea of the unibody, where essentially the frame is also the body itself. Um, so these lines, these funny lines, are actually rebar lines. Uh, where we started thinking about the thing, and then the rebar and the skin became one. Um, after some exercise, we realized we had one sleeve too much, but who cares? So we made three sleeves out of it, and the body is the jacket. And then we had a tiny, uh, archaic uh, little TV in here that had a fashion show and a little seating element. Um, the idea was that we would use this material that actually is, uh, you probably, you might know it, it's a concrete impregnated cloth, uh, about half an inch thick, and it was used in the 60s for bomb shelters. So the bomb shelter guy was quite happy, English, it's come from uh, England, he was quite happy that an architect asked him to use it for a pavilion because I think he saw a new market. Bomb shelters are not as hot anymore as they used to be. But he also sent me this movie, if it wants to play. Concrete canvas shelters are an award-winning technology that has been described as buildings in a bag. A 54 square meter variant can be deployed by two people in less than two hours. Definitely a solid. And is ready to use in under 24 hours. So essentially you can the have your own little bomb shelter a in your garden. The core new material called concrete cloth, a cement Very impregnated helpful. fabric. Concrete canvas shelters are rapidly deployable hardened structures that are deployed in four simple steps. Step one is delivery. The shelter is delivered folded and sealed in an airtight sack. We did sack have that little truck thing. And the shelter pulled out using a vehicle. Turned out we needed it. Step we two also didn't is have inflation. The, inflatable thing. the shelter is inflated using an electric fan. Ooh. Once inflated, it is pegged down around the base and is now ready for step three. At some point they try step and burn it down, is which hydration. is a big test ultimately. Water is sprayed onto the shelter until the surface is saturated. The final step is setting. The concrete cloth cures in the shape of the inflated inner and 24 hours later, the concrete canvas shelter is operational. The shelters can be covered in earth sand or snow, providing an excellent thermal performance and a force protection capability protecting against small arms fire and shell fragments. The hard, fireproof shell provides a level of security not possible with soft skin structures, protecting stores, equipment and personnel. So you guess it's safe. Concrete I'll, let, I'll let it go, it is. <laughs> It's really fun, you should download it. It's a very helpful little instruction. Anyway, we didn't have the little truck, we didn't have the inflatable things. It turned out to be quite dusty. So my, <laughs> my contractor are these guys in these hazmat suits that are trying to put this thing together. And the way we uh, worked with them is, um, when you saw this, this slide before, we gave them five methods. They could either rivet it, fold it, bend it, or uh, use pleating, and a lot of it uh, was this kind of um, leaning on the rebar uh, which, which we had designed, you saw earlier, 
Um, and then eventually what you saw, like what's really quite amazing about this material, you spray it with water and within four hours, it is uh, a rigid concrete shell that is only half an inch thick. Um, you probably are starting to get what I meant with ugly. Uh, what was kind of interesting about it, it has got this strange atmosphere, something between a war machine or a, um, as the organization of the Fashion Biennale said to me, we call it the cuddly elephant. Um, and here you see the ways these um, really thick uh, cloths start to be put together and uh, the idea of the, the rivets versus the rebar. A lot of people turned out to be constantly staring at it, mostly. We, find, we found people that didn't move anymore and just stood there and then once in a while knocked on it. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure that the, and what was also uh, interesting is that Ziki at that point was like, we don't need fashion, let's just call this the fashion thing. Uh, I like this thing a lot, I'm not gonna put any fashion in there and we convinced him to not do that because that sounded like a bad idea. And we did um, introduce the sleeves and we had uh, um, Fiziki's fashion on there. The biggest attractive was this strange movie that again turned out to be something uh, of um, a Tarkovsky movie almost uh, that, uh, that people for hours sat watching, uh, which was this tiny little uh, TV we found, which is probably the oldest black and white TV we still could find there. The methodology allows us to expand beyond architectural convention, opening the possibility of genuine innovation and discovery, while benefiting from the extensive construction knowledge we have developed over the years. Our focus is not on style or a recognizable signature, but a process that combines creativity with technical advancement from which merge, emerges a poetic precision. We have a lot of fashion clients. Um, I'm still waiting for that car company to just ask me to design a car, but for now I'm in fashion also a lot. Um, and a person we designed a house for um, asked us also to do her stores or come up with, a, I guess, a branding for her stores. Um, we did uh, London, Paris, and uh, Shanghai. This is the Shanghai store. We started thinking about Shanghai and shipbuilding, what it meant to be in uh, Shanghai, and proposed her that we would make a liner for their space that was very uh, reminiscent of the idea of um, something that had to do with shiplap uh, siding. Um, we bought an old Chinese house that we recycled and CNC'd into uh, these fat uh, walls that are the liner you saw earlier. And this archaic looking thing also had a lot of technology built in, like these slots are for air conditioning, these little holes have um, sound speakers behind it, uh, a lot of lighting was built in. So although the, the kind of fat archaic things uh, gave some sort of sense of comfort, they also had all the technology in them. Um, and then the surfaces were basically folded towards them. So GRFC is, uh, it's also a 60s, I must have something with 60s material. Anyway, it's also 60s material, Chinese people are very good at it. And these, uh, I forgot one where they're actually, the guy is sitting on this thing, sanding it down by hand. So this, you make, in the, you make prefab in the factory and then it comes here in uh, pieces and they are able to mold it uh, into one continuous uh, surface. That then starts to look like this. So the idea was that these surfaces, the middle uh, parts are more for the, the new uh, fashion items that they want to display. They had uh, felt seats molded into it, uh, custom brass tables. Uh, that we um, had poured and then uh, lighting from below and from above. Um, and then it looks kind of like this. It was a, a, an absolutely, this was actually the only contractor that I really thought was amazing. The guy was a mathematician and looked at the drawings and said, hyperparabola, I totally get this project. Don't worry about it. And literally asked me in the whole process one question, I think. 
uh, which was good because I didn't travel there very often. So yeah, when I came, I was like, oh my God, he actually got it. And it is, it is incredible to work in China in that sense because they do take things on with a rigor that um, is as an architect you really admire. Am I really softly spoken? Um, double solids, so we're getting into buildings. Um, this building is uh, one of my favorites. It was on a really strange spot in Manhattan where a highway splits and there is this tiny triangle left over. Um, and the developer asked us to uh, make a hotel there. And the hotel had a problem. Um, it had very low FAR, so if we added community service on the bottom, then he could build higher, which was for us a great moment to start to think of how this folding could happen on the, on the bottom. Um, it was also an incredibly uh, hectic spot, so for us it was really important to start to think of a body in a body uh, building to kind of really understand layers as a way to create an environment that could fluctuate from urban to private. Um, and the, the folding you see happening here really works between the community services, a drive-through, um, actually only a lobby to uh, take escalators up to the, to the bigger lobby of the hotel that was on the second floor. And the building essentially builds up like that. Um, so it has a large wooden uh, structure inside that has the super private areas and then every time it becomes more public like on the ground floor uh, here or in the community spaces or on the top where you have all the fitness spaces and the bars, uh, it becomes completely transparent and open. Uh, here you start to understand how it sits on that tiny triangle. Um, the openings uh, were on purpose kind of misaligned, so you would always get a kind of a sliver-like view between uh, your own traditional windows. The, the wood uh, block had like pretty traditional window openings like every hotel has, but then the screen started to play around with what was more um, kind of a shifting so that the city would come by in different uh, slivers. And at night, you really start to see the body inside uh, that really stops at points and pulls back from the outer skin in quite drastic ways. Um, here you see that this, this is actually the only point the hotel hits the ground where the escalators go up. And when you come up with these escalators, you are kind of in this lobby. This building sadly did not get built, but it did get ex uh, exhibited in the show uh, that was in New York last year of unbuilt uh, buildings, um, which was an amazing show because they took everything that, everything, almost everything that in New York did not get built. So uh, the part with the architects that were still alive was pretty small. I think there were only eight of us, uh, but there were an amazing range of uh, buildings and plans that were done for New York that were not built. So it was kind of like showing what New York could have been if all these buildings had been built. Uh, which was fascinating. These are Stephen Hall's uh, edge of the city towers. I think I was an intern actually at Stephen Hall and got fired. There you go. But I was building one of those and uh, mine is not in there, I can tell you that. I saw Stephen there and said, why didn't you put mine in? <laughs> Obviously not. I was a very bad model maker. I love 3D printers, obviously. Um, triple solids. So this gets to be a bit more of a, a very little tiny townhouse. It's an eight-story townhouse for one family. Uh, in their optimism, they said no elevators because they're very young, and then they got twins and one of those gigantic strollers, and now there is an elevator. So this is the elevator that you see here. Um, but what was really fun, and it's kind of interesting if you start working, and this is actually across from uh, our first building that uh, has a folded um, glass curtain wall. Um, and this little townhouse had a strange thing that the existing building was almost the same size as what we added, which I find unacceptable. You cannot call it an addition if it's the same size. So I said to the office, let's just add a third building, kind of a climate skin that is um, maybe like the other building, the perfect volume where the an imperfect uh, stuff happens inside. And that way we get kind of a little tower like San Gimignano and we start to play around with how these surfaces can transform. 
everything here that is irregular can open uh, and, and basically uh, split open, like you can see here. Um, and the idea was really that if this trellis opens, that this, this building can constantly transform itself. It also gave us an opportunity to give these people a ton of extra space that isn't really official. So these balconies are all um, something that I explained to the city as remainders of the old fire escape that I kept, which is completely impossible, don't ever try that. But I kind of rebuilt them and then, um, so this is hovering out over the sidewalk essentially. And then on the top, it has a, an outside room that uh, gives more privacy. If you ever have a roof terrace in New York, it's impossible. Tons of skyscrapers looking on your little roof terrace and not a moment that you feel like you actually want to sit there. So we decided to make a room out of that. And then um, we started prototyping this. What I thought would be interesting is to see if this is the screen that is flat, that if it folded out that these, um, these slats would start to kind of give a hairy feeling so that all these things are actually sticking out uh, from the frame and that that transformation would constantly happen. So that would kind of start to look like that. And from the inside, uh, one thing we um, also realized, eight stories is a lot of floor space. So um, we just kept cutting holes in it. You know, try and make as many holes as we could so that you really feel the verticality of these spaces uh, and this curtain wall flying by. So the, the, the prototype became the actual production and this is now how we um, start to uh, work this. So the, this is actually the GSC who is um, just building an actuator so that uh, eventually uh, with a little press of the button this whole facade can start to move and uh, create a constant change of uh, these fins going in and out of uh, its surface. And it was actually quite fascinating to see it. So it also pulls flat, which, which this is only happening with one little actuator. Um, we have one, an engineer at Penn that is uh, huge in kinetics. And uh, so the engineer was there with the contractor. Basically, there's no big company doing this. We're doing this all ourselves. Um, and it's, it's a quite a fun, uh, fun experiment, I have to say. Um, then here you have this, so this is the whole little building. Uh, the elevator is a glass elevator. We cut a hole in the whole south facade. It was, the building is enclosed on three sides, but on the one side is a tiny courtyard. So we cut a huge slot, so the glass elevator allows light uh, on this staircase. Um, that then turns the corner and flies up to the roof. These are construction photos, obviously. Uh, but you can start to see how this space is constantly turning around and weaving uh, in itself. And this is uh, still under construction, but you start to see the, the skin coming up. This was for one split moment that the scaffolds came down and we took quickly a photo. Now the scaffolds are back up because they're still putting the actuators on the, on the facade. Um, but fascinating to have an eight-story house. It is, uh, the, <laughs> I think the contract is in the best shape he's ever been uh, to have a construction site that is that high, and the elevator was obviously not there. Uh, was quite a challenge. And to also build in such a tiny site in the city. Uh, we're going a little bigger. Somehow I actually didn't realize we're getting bigger now. Um, this is a tower we're working on in Rotterdam, uh, where I come from. Um, and started to thinking about self-similarity forms. Uh, let's say objects that differentiate themselves with a, with a self-similar system, um, that I'm, but are not the same necessarily. Um, this tower sits here in the middle of the city. These are the harbors, big road, other big road. So it sits uh, kind of on the cross of that. And what we were interested in is to think could we make a tower that has anomalies, a tower that has objects stuck into it that are of a different system, um, like these guys that are then connected through long lines to similar so objects that are happening on the bottom. So you could say maybe there's a series of anomalies that are large crystals poked through the, the curtain walls. The other thing is that that would then give us a chance to uh, create other functions in these towers and also to create daylight deep into the lobby uh, to um, really minimize uh, use of energy in a tower. Um, 
One thing I actually never talk about is uh, green architecture. Um, I don't talk about it because I think we all need to think that way. Use recycled materials, think of climate uh, change, and reduce the footprint of what we do in some drastic way. Um, so hence, we usually work with also with uh, climate engineers um, of Bureau Happel to figure out how we can create skins where the the way we use the skin is that the cooler side will actually cool the warmer side and vice versa. Or create these cuts that are um, creating daylight but also allow uh, the moment to look back up at the tower and the sky. Um, this is then one of those crystals inserted. Um, the frames also get extremely large, as you can see here. So where the tower itself has a pretty generic uh, curtain wall system and is, is really pretty standard, except for the fact that it's um, tapered. Uh, it has these large moments inserted that create um, the one before, or this one, which is the, the um, hotel, or actually this is not a hotel, this is a residence, but the residence is gym and sauna. Um, and then this is how it sits in the city, where these crystals start to catch light and start to um, integrate themselves in the city in an interesting way because it starts to also give moments where you have in a, in a dense system a moment of relief of actually being able to op occupy a larger space. Something which happens very rarely, um, one thing I've observed about towers is that usually there's something on the roof, something on the bottom, but never something in the middle. So we started thinking of these sky lobbies really as kind of moments to create a city or pulling the city up and making public moments in um, in the tower, that then at night you would see these lines pulling out of the ground almost, uh, or out of the ground lobby uh, into these uh, upper lobbies, uh, which will give you kind of a very different kind of reading of what a tower could be. I'm going back to micro. This is one of the things I really love about architecture, you know, like. One thing I would warn you against, the, the one thing I really don't like about um, growing an office is that typically you start small and you end big. And what I realized halfway when I was doing bigger projects is that I really missed the small projects because a big project for five years, you're just redlining, shop drawings and you're just fighting budgets. And if you actually have small projects in between like this little guy, you have a moment to finish something really fast to prototype, to invent things. So this is one of the little babies uh, that a client, a fashion client of mine, uh, surprise, surprise, went into a retreat for three weeks. Uh, that was a silent retreat, never do that. It's very dangerous. Uh, he came back, he sold his fashion company and he started a meditation, com a meditation concept really. And asked me um, to kind of brainstorm with him on that. So sh it's clear, right? You cannot speak. And we started thinking about things that had something to do with volumes that were about hiding and revealing. Um, we studied um, how to make an enclosure that would not be a wall or um, a ceiling, but something that would be kind of, again, like a unibody that would be able to um, give a, a sense of enclosure without being enclosed. So we looked very much at dynamic circling systems um, checked how thick and how thin these systems would be, uh, went through the forces. It was quite a violent, actually funny enough, a quite violent system because if you leave it open, uh, these, these um, spiraling lines really put a huge amount of force. So you get a lot of force on the top that we had to create a, a ring for. But ultimately, it was all to kind of create this moment of silence and peace. Now, my client is a very obs obsessive compulsive. So this is what we ended up doing in the office. All sitting on little tablets, figuring out how many people can we put in a space, how much space do they need, you know, going from here to here, uh, turning circles in the middle is my client. I actually missed the photo where my dog started to interact with us because he was like, what are you doing? Um, but it was quite good for us because, you know, this level of rigor that only someone in fashion can have, I think, is really interesting. So we created a space exactly for 45 people, believe it or not, uh, going through this. And what is really important, 
about the space is the no judgment. If you start meditating, you're not immediately yogi, right? The people who come to meditate that are bankers that have never been to a gym in their life. So the idea was really that this kind of um, our dome, as we call it, would sit on a very heavy edge that would create seating here that you can just sit on a bench like everyone can, or you can sit against it, or you can sit like a yogi in the middle. Um, and that, that dome also would not necessarily be visible from the outside. So on the outside, we just pull the walls up to the ceiling so it feels like this thing comes out of the ceiling and hangs like a gigantic heavy form and lightly touches the ground. Made an arch to kind of um, a portal, you could say, to, uh, to this other space that gives you um, that relief. And then, of course, again, like in the, in the fashion store, this space that looks kind of archaic and, and like a basket, you could say, is, is the most high-tech space you could imagine. So there is a, a gazillion micro speakers that uh, occupy that space uh, between the dome and the, the outer skin um, that gives perfect sound uh, and perfectly even sound so that there is not a big brother feeling like I do now. Uh, but like, imagine that the sound comes from everywhere uh, and the same with the lighting. We designed the lighting to be kind of like a horizon line. So we used also the height of this bench um, as a horizon line. Imagine the, the easiest way to meditate is at the ocean or uh, at a desert uh, where you have a clear line. So we, we recreated that and there's a similar uh, line at the top. The moment you come in, both are on. And then if you start meditating, the top dims down to the bottom. And then that is a kind of, that sounds all easy. And then to explain that to a fashion person, we made a beautiful little model for him, a 3D print. Uh, he loved the model. And he was like, I don't understand how it feels. So we came to Irvine here and started uh, milling foam to make a model for him. Initially, the idea was be that we make a sliver of it. But ultimately, we actually built the whole thing one to one and um, made a seat for him as well. So, you know, you saw us sit on these little cardboard uh, pieces. They actually turned into seats that are bamboo shells with a memory foam insert. And, um, and then, lo and behold, he's like, and now I want to meditate in it because I want to feel how, <laughs> how it works. So here he is on his seat. And uh, that was not everything. Then we all lay down. We had sound. The guy who was the, uh, the car designer who milled this for us and made this whole thing was laying down also because he, you know, McLean felt it was very important. You cannot work on something if you don't feel what it's going to be. So we were all in this factory, in this foam thing, uh, meditating. But the good story is that he completely um, loved it and we built it. So then the other thing is fashion. So a fashion person never thinks in one one-offs, right? They always think into, like car designers, they do a prototype and then they make millions of it. So his idea was, I'm going to make millions of these. And my answer was, well, we have to prefab it. So we made the whole thing prefab. And the only way to figure out how to build it is that we made a template in the space, um, prefab the frame um, in, the, in the factory. Um, the hollow spaces contain uh, also air, so you have to imagine Meditation is about all your senses. It's hearing, feeling, seeing, smelling. So it has, it has perfect filtered air with some aromatherapy. It has these micro speakers and light that also has um, uh, special colors for mood swings and stuff like that. So here we are building. This is the open ring that you can see uh, here. Here it's not calibrated yet, so it's still hanging a little bit under an angle. And then here it starts to be how it is. So you can start to see the different lights. Um, we were testing this. This is a lighting company that gave us an endless range. So every meditation has a different um, uh, color uh, effect with it. And uh, not so much for the colors, but because colors work on your system. And the idea of this meditation center is really that we all use uh, about 10% of our capacity. And through meditation, you can actually uh, very fast uh, enlarge your capacity to think and have clarity. 
But then from the outside, they look like these gigantic, big, uh, heavy uh, things um, that sit in the space quite comfortably and also are surrounded by um, retail, fashion. So yeah, he's, he was like, maybe I want retail, but I don't know that I want retail. Uh, and our answer was, well, then maybe we design something that looks like a sculpture on the wall and could be for acoustic reasons. Um, but then if you have retail, you can eventually put some things on it. Um, so here it was just installed. And what was quite interesting is that the first six months, I think he lived off the retail because it became hugely popular. Um, we had uh, seats actually made. These seats here are made by Ligne Rosé. Uh, we got him excited about the idea of meditating and um, he actually helped us uh, develop these guys. So they're super comfortable and they actually work very, very well. So these are also sold and these blankets are from Tibet. Um, and then it got fuller and fuller. So now these things are super overloaded, but they still keep uh, leaving some flaps up. So the, the system, the way it works is that this is just a triangular thing uh, that basically if you flip it down, it leans on its own uh, geometry, let's say. And then Wired Magazine was so kind to call us one of the best uh, 25 architecture pieces in 2016. Uh, between all the big buildings, this tiny meditation center made it. So that was quite nice. And now uh, the, the next phase is that we're brainstorming about pop-ups. So we're starting to think about Burning Man, uh, meditating on the beach, and how are we going to build these, uh, these things as kind of I'm thinking of them as upside down uh, systems now. And then to close is uh, another more solids, um, a project we just uh, started, which is um, actually this whole park. So it's a mile long park with two stadiums. Um, and we, we started kind of thinking like, my God, what is a stadium? You always see these gigantic whales sitting everywhere and they're kind of one liners. So, you know, and, that, and that's how, funny enough how it started. So. Um, they, they started originally as a line in a landscape. We were more interested in topological deformations and seeing how these things became something more as an object in an object or an object in itself. Um, but maybe it could have some ramifications on the landscape. Um, and then this is kind of where we, we ended up. I'll go first further. So the idea was uh, the client had asked, in the com this is a competition for, um, I think five architects from basically all over the world, so Germans, Australians, um, English, uh, we were the US and some other company. Um, the client wanted two stadiums here, one here and one here, and this is a road and this is a whole site and this is a mile long. And we felt like, my God, you know, then this whole park is basically the backyard of a stadium. So we quickly got to the point that, um, well, this is a road and, and it's a river. So basically, this is this. So either you go over uh, this road to make it into one side, or you go under, uh, or you go both. And we decided very quickly what we want to do is to basically put not the stadiums right at the road, but in the middle of these uh, parks as kind of attractors or generators, and have uh, the underground shopping mall that they were asking for be the kind of uh, connective. Uh, device. So instead of an underground shopping mall, we said, let's just dip the park under the road and start to create something that is connective. So here is the one stadium. Then you see this thing going under the road, under the river to the other stadium that is an outdoor hockey stadium. And this, funny enough, is a table tennis uh, stadium. And then, you know, you, you get all kinds of interesting things where you have to think about how to go under, like how do you get up with escalators, what is the river. Uh, it's a very Dutch project. They said to me, it's only, uh, we're only allowing this because you're from Holland. And it's kind of worrying, but like, I know nothing about the rivers as bridges. But we did sell it with a lot of Dutch photos where we have airplanes going over the highway and ships in canals going over the highway. And so I guess it's possible. I'm not, you know, it's, it's going to be very interesting. So this is the kind of idea of our uh, shopping mall that is essentially just uh, a simple park with pavilions that, oops, sorry, 
that goes under uh, the whole thing and then slowly comes out and hits the stadiums. A solar wing um, is here that lights the, the park. And then this, this whole thing that has these solar wings goes under these areas and has these uh, pavilions is essentially the whole kind of, uh, you could say, artery of the site that connects the two stadiums to each other, but also generates most of the energy for the park. Um, there's a lot of underground activity still going on. There's gigantic parking garages and future shopping malls and uh, theaters and, I mean, there's an incredible, so what they call it, so you first have the Asian Games 2022, but then you have life, right? So life after the Asian Games is only two weeks, then we have a park. And that was also our statement. We really wanted to make a park for the city and not a, a stadium, right? So we actually thought the stadium was less important. We thought the park as a green lung in the city was really important. And then the stadiums eventually, hopefully, are a theater or a concert hall. Um, and then here you start to see how that's going to work. And then we get to the, the first stadium. The table tennis stadium, we were quite inspired by this weird thing. This is called the Kong, C-O-N-G. It is a strange artifact that they have in China. They don't know what it means. It shows up in old graves and, and traditional burying sites, but they have no idea what it actually means. That kind of felt good. You know, I like that. It's like a, a strange thing. You don't know what it is, but everyone thinks it's important. And so that seemed something to hold on to rather than balloons or other things they have. And I liked the idea that the thing was an object in an object um, and started looking at that. But um, we found out that the square and the circle we didn't like. And the reason why I'm looking at this intersection is to get away from the singular whale-like stadium and to really think of this building as a future more complex set of entities where you could possibly imagine that by shifting these things around, uh, like you can see here, we have, I think, 64 of them, uh, that by shifting them around and cutting them apart, uh, you allow the one object to cut through the other one, the inner bowl, let's say, to cut through the outer bowl, and to also create more edges where uh, things start to get complex, uh, outdoor areas start to exist, and these, uh, so these guys intersect. You get um, the idea of the stadium in the side, but then also all these kind of circling, uh, circling uh, infrastructures around it. And the idea was also to start to think about the seating as something that could be a hybrid between an arena and, an, and a traditional um, theater. So we made this kind of thing that is in between both and to kind of explain the, the, the transitional uh, nature of this building and hopefully that it would end up at something that would have concerts and uh, theater um, transforming from sports, uh, sports arena. So that there is kind of a constant transformation possible. So you literally could go from uh, this being table tennis to a concert at night uh, without any changes, just using light and uh, darkness as a, as a device. Then the next thing which is which always interesting is, uh, this is really the, these are the first drawings we did where the intersection is super clunky and uh, unworked out. Uh, that's also what they said to us, <laughs> which is totally true because we, we literally had uh, six weeks to prevent, to basically come up with uh, five buildings and a park. And, um, you know, I, I remember in my office, people were super pissed off with me because the geometries were really clashing, you know, like, because I was like, no, no, we have to pull it through each other. You can't have this, like, I don't want to wail. And what was really beautiful, you started getting accidents where, for example, the, this diagrid glass thing started to push through the bottom also. Uh, whereas this kind of brass shingle of volume starts to wrap around it here. This is where we cut it apart. So these kind of, because of the pushing one through the other, you get these strange bulges in the skin. Um, the, the heights were different, so you get a, a strange uh, cut in the, in the roof also. And then uh, I hired a really good curtain wall consultant. I've always worked with him. This is Bill Logan from uh, Israel Berger. Amazing guy who's a sailor. 
and uh, is the most capable of understanding concepts and keeping it really tight to the concept while still uh, making it buildable. So he said, well, this is essentially a very simple problem, which I love about him. Um, and, and came up with the idea, just simply looking at what our um, digrid was, to make steel, a steel digrid, very simple, and triangular uh, aluminum fins. So me, basically I asked him, I want to keep the glass planar. But I also wanted to have the facade look very much like a shark skin, like this weird, clumsy, um, very um, not smooth, let's say, because the thing is enormous, right? It is a gigantic um, ball. And I wanted to have a lot of definition in this. You can see the difference between that and then having all these edges starting to appear. Um, so that's basically a very simple uh, version. And then for the, the GC, you have to imagine while we are going through SD and DD, we won in April. We presented SD, I think, the end of July, beginning of July, and we just went to DD. And it starts construction in December. Um, so <laughs> it is an insane speed. Uh, so while we are doing this, we're also unfolding the whole thing. Um, to give to the contractor to calculate surfaces and uh, make quotes. So this is now how it's starting to look. These are just like, I'm, just, I'm not showing any fancy renderings here because we have had no time to do those. So everything is in working progress, but you start to see these, all these little edges starting to appear. And uh, the building essentially is this gigantic inner ball that has these outside areas that are folding around it. Um, and a gigantic opening in the middle that becomes a light catcher. So uh, there is a, um, uh, you could say, sort of a, almost like a, the Kimball Museum, you know, like one of those big uh, light reflectors in the middle. Because ping pong cannot have any direct light, but it can also have no air conditioning or air because it's a tiny ball. So it's quite an interesting thing to study. As the um, thing how it is. And then essentially at night you start to see the traces. And then we get through this uh, valley village to this little guy that we actually did look at something more romantic in China. We just looked simply at the, their umbrellas. They're incredible, uh, very light and very, they're able very, very light system to make a very large span. So um, we were thinking this, they kept saying temporary. I don't know what that means, temporary, but we thought we could make the smallest little building that essentially gets created from uh, the seating and then just put a gigantic kind of um, thing with handles over it, uh, a canopy, I guess, uh, that has a kind of a translucent quality um, and starts to protect the, the viewers from uh, sun and uh, wind and all those things, but at the same time, it kind of also gives the entrance uh, a really nice protection. And then we kind of thought of it a little, this is a kind of a funny thing, but from the air it looks like yin yang because you get a circle here. And then we made the, the playing field go from five meters to zero here, uh, thinking that it could be kind of a sculpture in the landscape um, that if you didn't use it at all anymore, it would just be great to sit at and to uh, hang out in. So here you start to see the, so essentially the wing that is over never touches the building. So it's kind of this big thing. I didn't like these guys poking out. Um, you know, so tortured my uh, structure engineer a bit. The spans are really out of the world. I mean, I'm really curious to see this thing being built. But then um, we also felt like coming back to wood that we wanted to use um, glue lamps. These are like gigantic laminated beams in the facade and to keep this kind of a wood structure and, and really keep that temporal feeling in that building, which would give this on the inside with bamboo walls. And then the outside with this kind of weird little hat on it. We got rid of these now. These are now steel cables with just gigantic trusses. And Chinese, they love their stairs, so we had to deal with uh, having a stair, which I kind of really hate, but whatever, we have the stair. And then to minimize the stair, we've made the grass also go up. So essentially everything goes up now, and now I think it's kind of good again. 
um, and then to hold this whole thing down, because you can imagine, uh, not to be too, too uh, engineering-like, but this is a massive thing to fly up in the air. So there are gigantic concrete uh, things here that are six meters high. Six meters is, uh, how much is that? Lots of feet, 10, what is it? 10 feet is 30, 20 feet high. So these are all the little studies. And what is really fun about this is Sir Thornton Tomasetti working with us on, uh, on these structures. Essentially, this is not, this is a very, they, here they were explaining to our client how easy it was to erect. So basically you get all these little bits on site, you, you stick them under the, the arches, uh, like you kind of pull the thing up on site and then suddenly the wing is there. So you can see here they're pulling one up. Um, and these are the cranes pulling them up. So it's going to be an interesting exercise, especially with the cables. Cables is going to be here. You see the old ones still. It's too uh, weird looking, I thought. But I think in, in the simplicity of the little wing is going to be uh, a really nice aspect of this. And then the sculptural aspect of the ring. So this little guy we try to keep really simple. And then this was asked uh, two days ago. Um, I walked into this meeting room and I find this, this very old render that was right in the beginning. And then when we, uh, after a nine hour meeting, we drove to, the, um, to, to dinner and I look sideways and I think, oh my God, this is actually our, um, it took actually a while before I realized we're driving by because it's you know, a mile long. So I was like, oh my God, this looks kind of familiar. And I realized <laughs> these are our renderings. And we were actually driving by our own site that had a million renderings on it. So it's a mile and then half a mile and a mile and half a mile. So three miles. Thank you.